My name is Pastor Sergeant Bethany Murrow. I am with the 79th Air Refueling Squadron. I am a KC-10 boom operator, and I have been flying for over 10 years, and four specifically with the 10. For Operation Allies Refuge, I was a, um, one of the volunteers. Uh, we went out with, I think, five crews from the 79th and like three or four from the 70th. I can't remember how many people it took. Um, it, was, <laughs> it was a regular Friday and we were just all hanging out and I was getting ready to do my rounds and say bye for the day and all of a sudden everybody was on their phones and I got a list being asked if I could call these people to make sure that they were still okay to volunteer. Because the week prior, we had kind of gathered names to see who would be willing to go. And um, within, I want to say, three to four hours, we had everyone lined up, everyone ready to go. Um, I'm also the unit deployment manager, so we went through our stuff to get everybody's paperwork together. And I don't even remember driving home that day. It was just kind of like, we're going to go do this. And uh, we really didn't know what to expect because our active duty counterparts hadn't flown any missions yet. They had just been sitting on alert and waiting. So um, yeah, I went home, uh, told my wife what was going on. She was like, all right, let's go. She's like, I got this taken care of here. Pack your stuff, get out. <laughs> To prepare for something like this, uh, which was very much outside of any of our, I guess not quite our imagination, but because we had been kind of gearing up towards it for the week. Um, but to prepare for it, it definitely is just always being ready to go somewhere. Uh, it's one of the great things about our squadron, uh, the 79th and the 70th, is that our product is to be ready. Um, we, we have our annual requirements, our monthly requirements, um, our mobilization requirements. Uh, the, the 79th had just finished deploying um, consistently for quite a while, so we still had a lot of people who were ready to go. Um, and then just being aware what was going on in the world, that there was a possibility. Uh, I want to say the day prior, I was asking if we thought this might happen, if we were going to go, and they were like, oh, no, no, we're not going to go. <laughs> Active duty's got it. And then the next day, it's like, okay, actually, we're gonna go help out. And um, I was actually really hoping that there was something that I could do as an individual and just having this opportunity to volunteer, we were all volunteers, to go out and, and to be part of this. Cause I didn't really care about the politics or what had gotten us to this point. There were just people out there that needed help. And that's what we wanted to do. Uh, so the process that got us leaving Travis and getting to Milton Hall, um, where we were staging at, was kind of different because usually we show up for our own briefings and we do our paperwork and we get all of our stuff for our flight, whereas we were generated as passengers, so that was kind of strange. And to sit backwards on a C5 was, I've only been on one, I think, two times prior, so just kind of going up and not having to do anything for a flight was weird because usually you know, mentally preparing yourself the night before, you're going through your pubs, you're making sure everything's good to go, you got all your, your items and stuff, and then to sit on the plane and, and not do anything was, was definitely weird. I mean, it was a lot of pacing around on the plane, just trying to like, I got a good night's sleep, so I'm not gonna sleep on the plane. And then we were also just super amped about like what was gonna happen when we got there. Um, so yeah, that was kind of all that, and then making sure everything was good at home, which being a flyer, that's kind of what we're always ready for. You just you always have your family briefed. So the flights, um, once we actually started going from Milden Hall to uh, LUD to pick up from there, um, a lot of it was we had channels in Mattermost. So we were talking with other boom operators who had just flown, um, what they were experiencing, what they should have brought. Um, we were pretty limited on supplies where we were at. Milden Hall is um, not very like equipped for that big of a flux of people to come in um so we didn't have we didn't know that they needed food for the passengers like we didn't have any of that kind of the comfort items um but we did kind of sit down as a group before we left with our chief and talk about what to expect with these passengers that these people are going to have next to nothing probably not even have shoes on some people are going to have full baggage um you know there's going to be kids without adults and just 
we were gonna see a wide range of people from different classes and, and different levels of just fleeing, I guess is the, guess the best way. Um, and that they were all gonna be in need of some something. Um, so we, we were able to get some stuff from the spouses group out there, which were awesome. They came out and made sure that we were comfortable where we were at, knowing that we didn't really know what was going on. Um, they did a cookout for us and they did all this stuff to prepare us and to help us while we were out there. And they made packets of um, like coloring books and stuff. They took out pages from kids' books. So we had individual Ziploc baggies, crayons, and coloring paper to hand out. And that was, I think that made like a huge difference on our flight, just that being able to comfort people in a time where you just really can't do anything for them, just a little bit of something. Uh, so our missions in general, um, we were all basically sitting there and going to get tasked differently. Every crew was going to be differently tasked. Our first mission that we were told was we were going to go up and refuel C-17s to extend their legs. Uh, and then that changed to you're going to go to um, Dafra, and then that changed to you're going to go to Al Udeed. So it, it was up until the point where we were loading up and doing all of our stuff for our flights that we finally found out where exactly we were going to go because we got the flight plan and what the expectations were there. And even then, we didn't know what to expect when we got on the ground. Um, it was a eight hour flight um, and we prepped the jet by um, making sure all the straps were good, that the pallets were ready, that we had all the space set up and that we had a latrine situation because the there's only one bathroom on the plane <laughs> and uh, that was that's very limited and we were expecting up to 200 passengers um, we ended up not having that many um, we tried we told them that we could take more uh, but they weren't able to clear them fast enough which is you know they had a whole other situation going on that we were you do what you gotta do we'll be here for you um, but the missions itself was basically to get down there, get as many as we can out of the deed and take them to wherever host nation was gonna take them. Uh, we had one flight, not mine, but we had a flight that ended up taking them stateside. And so I don't, I don't really know where they went after that. Um, I just know that on my flight, we went from Mildenhall to uh, the deed and sat there for quite a while and listened to the radios and just sat on the, on the ground waiting for them to bring us our passengers. Um, and then we took them to Germany. And then we flew back to Milton Hall and that was probably the, the hairiest 45 minute flight of my life. We were so tired. It was, it was like, this is, we're in danger. <laughs> I mean, you know, we were within our limits. If anything was that bad, we would have all called knock it off. But whew, man, I was exhausted. <laughs> When it came to when we got to country to pick up our passengers, uh, usually we have like a PAX terminal person that comes up, brings us a manifest, we check it, we make sure of all the names and that they've been anti-hijacked and just, there's lots of steps that we usually have to do. So it was very strange to get there. Um, I think we sat on the ground for four hours in the middle of the night, which um, the aircraft was overheating. It was just, you know, we were trying to do what we could. The maintenance, uh, our flying crew chiefs had to get off the jet and do maintenance while we stopped. Um, we just kind of made sure that we were all good to go, that mentally we had all talked to each other and checked in with each other, um, and then just kind of sat and waited. And that was, the waiting was really hard because we just wanted to get them on so we could get them out so another plane could come in because it was basically one in, one out for, for the outgoing for us. Um, so we were sitting there and a bus pulled up and then just a line of people were just running to the plane. I mean, they didn't have to run but I think at that point it was, they were just trying to get to the next step and not get left behind. Uh, the other boom operators, so we had an augmented crew. We had two engineers, four pilots, and two boom operators. And then we had a, um, we had some Ravens that came on with us who, those poor guys, they were so tired. They were falling asleep on their feet, but they were there to make sure that nothing bad happened to us or the passengers. Um, so once we started loading, I was in the back of the aircraft directing them to come to me. Um, you know, we had gloves and masks and at a certain point, um, the human factor kind of kicked in and I was feeling that 
um, we might not speak the same language, but I wanted to see my face. So I took my mask off and I figured we're gonna be on the plane together for this amount of time. If anything happens, it happens. And uh, so I was back there and we had been training before we left that when we are going to floor load, that it was gonna be a certain number to a certain number of straps on the pallets and that just went out the window. They wanted to stay in their groups, which I completely understand. Safety, you know, people you know, these people have probably never met each other before in their lives. So we were trying to get them to come to us, sit down, sit down. So I'm just kind of working my way through the jet as I'm trying to get them to kind of go to certain spots, making sure they're not going to the back of the aircraft where all the other equipment was stored. Um, just, and we had a pallet where all their bags were going because pe some people did actually have some luggage with them, which was good, good for them. Um, I'm glad they had something. And um, we also had people that came on with no, almost no clothes on. You know, it was, it was a wide, um, a wide gap in people. Um, we were trying to get a head count once we got them all on board. And I think I counted four times and I got a number, a different number every time. There was just like, you know, some people were very heavily garbed, so we couldn't see that they were carrying babies under there. Um, so I would look and I'd look at a woman. I'm like, where'd that kid come from? Like, where? <laughs> So we kept on going through and counting them and making sure that everybody was there and settled. So the, the onload was really hectic. Um, I actually, it, it kind of just, it, it was a blur. It was just trying to get people in because as soon as we got them all in, we can close the door and get out. And once we got um, out, then we could cool the jet down and feel really comfortable and probably feel some bit of like safety that they were getting somewhere with this whole thing. Um, we were armed. That was just, you know, the nature of the thing. Um, it was really uncomfortable to be carrying openly like that, um, knowing that I'm trying to get these people on here and get them to safety. But then at the same time, we were briefed before we left that not everyone was getting vetted completely, possibly. And you just don't know what was coming on. So just trying to be safe and protect ourselves and stuff. But I really did not like the image that it was projecting, but that's just what it was. We had a lot more women and children than we did men. Um, they kind of, the men kind of huddled together and were talking and doing their thing and they were kind of watching the crew. Um, didn't really want to talk to me. Didn't really want my input. Um, I, we didn't speak the same language. We did have one gentleman who said that he spoke English and kind of helped out. Um, but when it came to uh, handing out water, which was kind of the only thing besides the coloring books we had, um, the men would take it from me, but but kind of begrudgingly. Um, they preferred if my male counterpart would give them to them. Um, but the women were, they would make eye contact with me. They were trying to like sig like talk to me sort of in a, in a way uh, with hand signals, the way people do when they don't speak the same language. Um, and they would take, you know, the water from me and they would ask me like, kind of gesturing like, where's the bathroom? And just kind of, just trying to engage with me a little bit. And it, that was varying also with, um, with, what they were wearing. If they were fully garbed, um, most of those women didn't talk to me or make eye contact with me, but the women that were more, I guess, westernized, I'm not sure what that, you know, uh, but the women that were more engaging with me were, looked more like what I would wear, kind of, you know. Um, but the kids were hilarious. The kids were, you know, just being kids. I mean, there's this, this this crazy, horrible thing happening in their life. <laughs> and they still wanted to play peekaboo. <laughs> I had um, my camera rolling when we were unloading the passengers and there was these three kids. It was a teenager and I think his two younger brothers and they were all wearing the same thing. And no one else around them was really talking to them um, or kind of interacting with them. So I made sure to make sure that they got water and that um, if I had anything extra to give them, I tried. Uh, but there was one and he was definitely differently abled and uh, the sweetest little thing i gave him earplugs and i looked at him and i said don't eat this is for your ears and he just had the biggest grin and he was like i'm gonna eat it and then he joked with me and put it in his ears and it was just i think about them every day And I just wish I could have done more. You know, we were there doing what we could, but I really wish I could have done more. 
And I really hope that they're being taken care of because they were by themselves, you know. <sighs> yeah, <laughs> the kids were hard. The kids were the hardest part. Um, there was a baby that was in, um, that she was swaddled and she was like a little baby doll. They had her in a little, a little crown and a, and a whole thing. And um, I was trying to, it was kind of just, you know, we had eight hours to fly with each other. So we got to kind of know each other a little bit. And uh, the mom was sleeping and the baby was fussing. So I came over to kind of wake her up to see if she wanted to, to handle her. And then um, I was sitting there with her for a second. And the father, I think, spoke a little bit of English. I was asking how old she is. And he said that she was two days old. Little tiny thing, just so tiny, brand new. <laughs> Oh, yeah, the kids were, and they'd come running up to us and just trying to play with us. And um, I was making paper airplanes for them and we were throwing them and they would, uh, they were doing the coloring books and bringing it over to me and yeah, it was a, a, a touchstone of my life. And I know it was, it was really hard for some of the other crew members, some of them that did have kids. I heard from other crews that, you know, that was really hard for a lot of us because, you know, you work with adults and adults make choices and, you know, we're all products of this environment, but you have kids who are just innocent. There was a moment right after we took off that I think just the you could feel like the relief that they were getting out of there. And most of them didn't even know where we were taking them. They were just on the plane. Um, and then just trusting, just trusting that we were going to get them there. And um, it was, I, I looked back in the, in the cargo hold and they were all laid out. Just everyone was asleep, just zonks, just, you know, you could feel the relief. So we turned, we turned the heat to like, a, you know, something comfortable because it can get really cold back there and uh, just let them all sleep as long as they could. And then you'd see the kids start like to poke up and they're waking up and they're just kind of wandering around and wanting to like look out the windows, but it was dark outside or come talk to us or see what we had. And just, you know, just being kids, it was, and all of that, there was still just kids being kids. And then when we got to Germany, the sun had started to come up and they were all looking out the windows and seeing all the green and just, just wow, you could hear wow and excited and just, of course I had to go back there and make them all sit down because we were going to land and I didn't want them flying, but they were just so excited to just see all of that and just, you know, there's hope yet for this world with, with kids like that. So when we, we finally get to Germany, we land and we're, we're getting ready to let these guys go off to their next step. Um, I was really impressed by all of the uh, support agencies showing up and being there. Like there was, there were so many different parts to this whole thing. There were so many people doing their jobs, you know, volunteering, uh, having things ready and they were, they were ready. They had the bus, they had a whole line of people downstairs waiting for them to help them get onto the buses and to give them what they needed. Um, the only thing was they wanted us to make sure they had masks on. I was like, they didn't have masks when they got on the plane. Like, I, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Um, so opening that door and getting that that air in the jet and you could just feel it just coming through and you could see everybody just, they all livened up. Everybody was just super excited to be there and um, got a lot of thank yous and, and a lot of, you know, just trying to say thank you. And yeah, yeah. All the women would, you know, they would look over at us and I had a couple people grab my hands and thank me. And, yeah, it was pretty awesome. So with all this, the KC-10, um, I was very impressed with not just the aircraft, the airframe, but our community that flies her. Um, we had maintainers that volunteered. The reserve, everyone that went in the reserve was all volunteer. And we took that plane out there knowing that we have certain maintenance issues, knowing that the KC-10 is sundowning here soon, um, and knowing that we, we have a record of having aircraft issues and that's just, you know, she's an old bird. It's, it's how it's happening, um, but when we do the best we can. And our maintainers are 
heroes. They are unsung heroes. They get the job done. They, they're out there in the heat. They're out there in the cold. They're out there making sure the thing can fly. And you know, it's not like the air crew does that. It's not you know we just make sure we get it off the ground safely, and they make sure that it can get off the ground safely. Um, I want to say that every maintenance issue was fixed with with the utmost care and, and expedited that, that we were not going to be the weak link in that chain. Um, we have a varying level of experience on all the crews that went out, um, but we were able always to call home and, and run things by them. Like, we're gonna do this, is this safe, is this legal? Are we gonna, is this outside the realms of it? Is this not an acceptable risk? And you know, because we're, we're, we're in the front, we're out there like, well, yeah, we're gonna do whatever. We're gonna do everything that we can. And so we were checking ourselves and make sure we check that, yes, this is acceptable. Um, this is within whatever measurement we're gonna go with. Um, and I'm really sad to see the 10 go. It's, it's I, I flew medical before and I've flown on C-17, C, C-130s, uh, KC-135s, and the KC-10 has been my favorite. I might be a little biased, but, <laughs> um, and to be able to see us and, and that community do this mission, something that I would never thought that we would be able to do or would be asked to do, but to be able to go out there and help. And, and I know that the C-17s were doing the, the grunt of the work. They were doing the down and dirty, in and out, hard hours, just like, but you know, they're a tactical heavy, so that's kind of, part of their their business uh, for us you know I fly a lot of space A's and um, we take random cargo here and there but like primarily we do refueling and I didn't do any refueling <laughs> that was that's my job and we didn't do that um, so that was kind of wild that we went out there expecting to maybe help that way but to be told that you're actually gonna go and you're gonna pick up people and you're gonna get them to the next step in this journey was just like wild just the whole thing was just it was just wild the, the fact that we were able to do that um that we were able to pull all our resources together and and accomplish that it's just i am so proud of our units for doing that for it potentially being the end of the kc10 this is <sighs> what a way to send her off <laughs> Compared to the other career fields I've had and other operations I've been involved in and, and um, what I've, I've done previously to the 10, um, I think because this was so outside of our norm, um, and we train to what we know and then you have knowledge to fill in the gaps for when you do stuff like this. Um, I honestly hope I never have to do anything like it ever again. Um, when I was a medic, um, and flying, you know, um, battle wounded or, or whatnot stateside and back home to their, their last stops to go be with their family or treatment or whatever. Um, we trained for that. You know, we, we knew that, you know, if something happens, I have my, all my equipment to resuscitate that person or give them care and comfort while they're injured. And, and you know, we, we trained for all that stuff um, a lot. We train a lot for all those things, whether it's a medical emergency or aircraft emergency. And in this situation, there's no real way to train to bring people on an aircraft that wasn't built to do this, um, that are experiencing the worst things they've probably ever experienced in their lives. Um, there's just, it's, it's, it was a whole different world. You know, the only thing that was the same is that um, I was on my plane. <laughs> Uh, some of the challenges that we did face as individuals and a crew, um, it was kind of like this, this stuff that was the issue of a bunch of air crew coming into a base that wasn't ready for them. And so that was a bit challenging and uh, being at an airfield where we had to basically strip everything off the jet so that the, our normal pallet configuration, our, um, our additional seat kits that we use, our bunks, all of that had to come off and it just just scattered around base. So when we left, it was really hard to find all of our things <laughs> to take it back with us because we had to have a legal jet you know, to leave. All the waivers were done. Um, it was back to normal business. So 
you better have everything that you came here with. So that was that was a challenge. I think getting out of Milton Hall was was pretty rough because everybody was just trying to find, you know, where's their where's our stuff? <laughs> like I'm missing a fire extinguisher. It's kind of important. Um, the other challenges were definitely um, just the unknown. You know, we didn't know if we were going to get ravens. We didn't know how many passengers we were going to get. We didn't know how long we were going to stay there. We didn't know. Um, you know, what our airfield was going to look like. Uh, we were scheduled for another flight and we were on the runway getting ready to take off from Milton Hall and like ready to go for our second one. And we get called that something happened on the flight line down at the deed, so we couldn't go in there anymore. So we had to deconfigure and like uncock ourselves because we were ready to go. So the, the mental, I think, was probably the biggest challenge because I have so much faith in the people I fly with that uh, I know how to do my job, they know how to do their job, and we're gonna do them and I don't have to cross-reference everybody, you know? So like the actual flying part of it, that was gonna be cake. That was just gonna be, that's our normal business. But the mental gymnastics <laughs> was definitely probably one of the, the hardest things. Um, we did end up, leaving Milton Hall early to pre-position at Dafra, um, and we were hoping to get another two jets, jet loads of folks out of the deed. Um, but unfortunately, we came up to that deadline that, that was set, so they sent us all back. So that was, that was hard. That was the kind of anguish of you know, being at the edge and wanting to do more and being told you can't. One of the things I, I would like to share about this this whole experience is that um, they were just people needing help. And then, as a human, that's kind of our duty to help each other with any way we can. So, um, yeah, I just I just I hope that we helped.